Awesome. Welcome on this beautiful Sunday. Um, I'm going to read a scripture, and then we're going to open up with some worship. And then we have our very own Chris is going to give us a overview of what happened in Africa and going to tell us a little bit about how that went. So we'll start off with Daniel chapter 7. It is the vision of the Son of Man when the Son of Man is given dominion. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So as we worship today, let's remember who we're serving, the King of Kings. Thank you, Clarence. Welcome today to Breakwater Church. Lord, fill us with your spirit, Lord, as we, as we worship you, Lord, and so we can fully feel your presence. And thank you so much that you have saved us. You're the Savior, Lord. Thank you. We love you, and we pray this in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, I'm bad with my paperwork. I should have been better in school.
I once was lost in darkest night Thought I knew the way The sin that promised joy in life That led me to the grave I had no hope You would own a rebel to your will And if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still But as I ran my hell-bound race Indifferent to the cost You looked upon my helpless state Led me to the cross And I beheld God's love displayed You suffered in my place for the wrath reserved for me now all I know is grace hallelujah all I have is Christ hallelujah Jesus is my life now Lord I would be yours alone so all might see the strength to follow your commands that never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. Let my song forever be my only boast is you. Hallelujah. separate even if I ran away your love never fails I 
I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails Father God, your love never fails, Lord. All we have to do is open the door when you knock. And you change our lives. And you give us life. Thank you so much that we know you, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you, God the Father, that you changed our hearts. Just bless this day and bless this church, Lord. Bless Chris as he comes up and talks about the great things they're doing over there in, in uh, Malawi to uh, bring life and water to those people. Lord, we love you, and we pray this in your precious in Jesus' name. Amen. Then we're going to have Chris come up and give us a, a message.
All right. Just another minute here. So just a few uh, few family family uh, family points right here at the breakwater. We recently had uh, someone pass away. I don't know if you guys heard, but the the Velasquez family uh, lost John Velasquez, the the grandfather of Eden, father to Mondo. So just want to pray for them. Take a minute, pray for their family as they're grieving. So Lord. Uh, we come before you right now, and we pray for our brothers and sisters um, in the Velasquez family that are suffering from just a tragic death, um, an untimely death, and we just pray for them. I pray that you would bless them, Lord. I pray that there would be a deep abiding peace in their heart, knowing that uh, he's going to be in heaven, and they'll see him again, and we bless that family. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Also... I will be introducing to you today our very own Chris Eggleston. Um, yes, we're excited. Chris is an engineer at Northrop Grumman. He's 28 years old. He's been to Malawi with Kurt. This is his second trip. So he's seasoned. And he's going to come and he's going to tell us a little bit about that trip today and also give us a little message. He gave his life to Jesus in late 2019. And he doesn't look back since then. He's been serving Christ, and he's been a bright light in our community. We're thankful for him, and uh, he just never ceases to be an encouragement. So welcome up Chris Eggleston. All right. Thank you, Clarence, for the nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Like Clarence said, I'm Chris. I went to Africa with Kurt for the second time, and I got back on Thursday. I put together a presentation for you today to show you what we did in Malawi and also what we did in our short amount of time in Zimbabwe visiting Nick. So I put together a short video of some of the pictures and videos that I took on my iPhone. And so I want to present that, just give you a flavor and then I'll go into more detail in a PowerPoint and kind of walk through what happened and where we went. So without further ado, here is our 2022 recap. So anyways, this is Blantyre. We landed, we were in Blantyre, and now we're gearing up, we're getting all of our stuff ready. That's DAP, we bought some clothes, we put a burrito on a truck, basically we put our supplies under a tarp so they don't get dust on it. We drove up to the lake, there's my friend AJ who came with us this year, and we basically went to this area where they dry out the fish, that's what you were seeing there. Then we drove back to Mangochi where we were staying, We drove through some markets. So here's what our camp looks like in our kitchen. There's some people. And we did a Jesus film showing right outside our camp uh, after we got set up. Here's our uh, water well dedication. This is uh, my team went and dedicated the Church on the Beach water well. There we go. <laughs> This is the Jesus film showing. We have a chicken. Yep. Because it'll be Dina tomorrow. <laughs> AJ hit his head on the door.
This is a small Catholic school that we visited. Here's some. This is an old shallow well that they used to get water from. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> we are packing up off. Here we're packing up and leaving Mangoshi. Up there in America. Yeah. Feel you. Is it birds? Shared the gospel at the, the school in Blantyre. After a while, me and Pasekar went to Zimbabwe, and there's Nick. Yes, I know. I'm feeling too alone. So, okay, but so press him against the Tried fishing for a tiger fish. We didn't catch it. There's Nick doing a presentation. Okay, so that was just a real quick, you know, run through a lot of the pictures that I took and, you know, kind of a flavor of what happened on our trip. We went to Malawi, of course. We flew into Blantyre. Um, I'll show you, actually, I'll show you the flight path that we took to get there. But after Blantyre, and we don't do this every year, Pastor Kurt and I went to Zimbabwe. We went to, we flew into Harare and we drove to a place called Lasting Impressions. So I also want to share that with you. So I've called this presentation the Africa Outreach Outbrief 2022 here at the Breakwater Mega Embassy. So, so the first half will be the Malawi mission. I'll tell you about what happened, where we went, and just kind of how things went down. So before we even got on a plane, before we packed our bags, on April 29th of 2022, there was a press statement by the government of Malawi that said, at the time of arrival, we would need to be fully vaccinated for COVID-19, which was a problem because the majority of our team was not fully vaccinated for COVID-19. Within 20 days, 20 days later on the 19th of May, there was a new press statement that said we could produce a negative PCR test. So as you know, Typically, things don't get turned around that fast, but within 20 days, they had rescinded that requirement and allowed us into the country by a negative PCR test. God made a way for us, so we knew, you know, that, I mean, we just had favor, and we, we were so excited when we heard that. It's just one less obstacle for us to go and share the gospel. So we flew from LAX to London Heathrow was the first leg. It's about 10 hours and 15 minutes. Then we flew from London to Johannesburg, about 10 hours and 50 minutes. From Johannesburg, South Africa, we flew to Blantyre, which is, I don't know, a couple hours. And then from there, okay, so this is Malawi on a map. This was helpful for me last year because not a lot of people know where Malawi is. It's in Southern Africa and it's cradled by Mozambique on the bottom. Where we flew into was the southern part of Malawi called Blantyre. 
Blantyre is a major city. The capital of Malawi is Lilongwe, but we operate out of Blantyre, and when we get there, we usually set up shop and we stay in a bed and breakfast. From Blantyre, from that bed and breakfast, we drive in a caravan of cars and we go up to a village and we camp out. So we drove up to Mangochi for the first leg of our mission trip. Okay, so here we are in the airport. We actually, on our first day of flying, we met Emmanuel Mosley, who's the cornerback for the 49ers in the airport. So that was kind of a cool, you know, we just happened to run into this guy and we start chopping it up with him and he had his hood on, but we found out, oh, he's actually a, a football player in the NFL. So we're, this is, the, the picture on the right is us in London. We celebrated AJ's birthday with some bangers and mash in London. We landed in Blantyre. There's John on the left. He got bit by a dog. That was crazy. And then here's a tractor at the airport. I just love the John Deere tractor that pulls the luggage. So we got into Blantyre. We started unpacking the attic. We have a lot of supplies from years past. We pull it down, and we also go to the local store to get chickens, rice, just everything, bread, peanut butter, food for the week that we'd be in Mangochi. So. Here's another picture at ShopRite with our caravan of grocery carts. Okay, and then the first group that goes out is the Brood Squad, and we go and set up camp. I was on the Brood Squad with a couple other people. Here we are at the lake. There's AJ and Tammy, and Tammy's making this child crack up on the canoe. And behind AJ here, at the lake, they pull up nets of these small fish and they lay them out on these tables to dry so that they can fry them and sell them. It's a really interesting operation that they have. Yeah. So we drove back to camp. Here's a picture of us driving through a market. This might actually be a picture from Pastor Ross. Some are his pictures, some are mine. And this is where we stayed. This is in a little place called Kela in Mangochi. Kayla Village, and so on the right side is the, the place where we stayed, the church. The left side over here is our little kitchen area, and back there is the shower. So if you've never showered in the bush before in Malawi, they fill up a big bucket with hot water that they boiled, and they put it in this enclosed area, and you take a plastic cup, and you pour it over your head, and you wash your hair, you wash your body, and you work your way down from there. It's, it's an interesting way of showering. It was my first time doing that last year. Here's the inside of the church. You'll notice the thatch roof. There was uh, bugs and hornets in it, which was, it was eye-opening to me that the mosquito nets are not just for mosquitoes. You never know what could fall from the ceiling. It could be bugs. And um, then you'll notice we have the tarp to separate the guys and the girls section. So this kind of gives you a flavor of what our camping setup looks like. Also, we lost those crispy jalapenos somewhere. I'm still wondering where we had that. There's our fearless leader. Okay, so I put this slide in here because this man in the blue tank top, his name is Lamech, and 18 years ago in this village in Kayla, we put in a water well. So Lamech was a boy on, you know, jumping up and down with excitement when the borehole drilling truck came into his village. And now he's a grown man, he's got two children, who have never known waterborne disease because of the water well in their village. That's a, that's a testimony right there. We were so excited to interview him and hear about how life changed. So we're so happy about that. And yeah, so then here is a picture that I took um, of our little kitchen setup and the lady that helped cook and clean. There's a couple ladies that always help us to cook and clean and make sure that we have everything we need to survive out there. And then Pastor Ross, of course, took a much better picture. So that's their little kitchen setup. Okay. Here in, this is the same place in Kela Village, we're setting up the Jesus film. We've put up our screen already, and once it gets a little darker, we'll set up our projector. There's already a little crowd gathering. This is right outside where we were staying. You'll see in the background there's a fire they actually burned a lot of the brush next to us in order to, you know, push away black mambas. So that was, I'm, I was actually really kind of surprised. I was thinking, oh, 
I had no idea there was black mamas, but I'm so glad that they're doing that. Yes. So at first I was like, whoa, something must be wrong. There's a big fire. But no, it was to deter the black mamas. Okay, so we set up the Jesus film screen. Here it's getting a little darker, and on the right side of the screen you'll see uh, our pastor coming up. His name is Andrew, and pastor, pastor in Chichewa, you would call him Abusa. So sometimes you'll hear us call Pastor Kurt Abusa Kurt, um, but that's Chichewa for, yeah, for pastor. So this is... At the end of the Jesus film, when Jesus is on the cross, they typically ask me to pause the film right when they lift him up on the cross. And that's what you're seeing up there. And Andrew will get on the microphone, we'll put a light on, and he'll get up and preach, and he'll share the gospel. And he'll tell basically what we've already heard all of us know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. These Malawans do not hold back. They tell about the real problem with human beings, and that's the sin problem, that we've all broken the Ten Commandments, that we've all lied, stolen, been dishonest and disrespected our parents. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, to name just a few commandments. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's some good news. And then he'll say, is there anybody here who wants to make a decision for Christ? I don't know what he says because he says it in Chichewa. But he'll get a crowd and they'll be moved. They'll be cut to the heart. There's no TV out there. There's no social media out there. There's no Spotify out there. So when you give these people the option to have eternal life, why wouldn't they want that? They think in their head, why wouldn't I want that? And so I put the scripture on here. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So these kids are making their first step in their walk with Jesus. You know, they've confessed with their mouth and they believed in their heart. This is step one in their walk. We don't leave them and just say, okay, you're saved, go on. We tell them there's four ways that you can grow as a Christian. Typically when we're sharing the gospel, we tell them there's four ways that you can grow. You can read your Bible. You can share your faith with your friends, share this decision that you've just made. You can pray to God who will hear you and you can go to your local church. That's right, the four things. Here's our truck, you might have seen it in the video. This is our sweet new Hilux. It's the name of a Toyota truck that we don't have here in the States. It's H-I-L-U-X. We've been calling it Hiluxury because it's so much nicer than the older cars that we had. Um, so anyways, this is kind of an indication of the road. You see, it's kind of a ravine. You know, this, some of the roads are kind of rocky. I want to give you guys a picture. You know, we're driving through brush and back roads. Sometimes the roads get as thin as a bike path back there. And uh, it makes it interesting trying to get to these remote villages. So here's a picture of the Church on the Beach water well. And that was dedicated by Church on the Beach in Manhattan Beach. We had a really good time celebrating up here. This is where John got bit by a dog. And this is also where we found out that we broke the rivet gun, which is why you see the stem of the rivet sticking out on the left side of the screen. So, but we overcame and we figured out a solution to make it work. Chris. Hello? Did John have to have rabies treatment? Was it a wild dog? Um, it, it was a wild, yeah, it was a wild dog. Heart to heart was right there. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's done. He's home now and he's okay. He's okay. okay. He's okay. Yeah, sorry, don't worry about John, but. Yeah, oh yeah. I gave, I gave kind of a concerning update, and then we never got the. <laughs> Whoops! I apologize for the first. I didn't. I should have followed up on that one. John's okay. I've been. T I texted him. He seem, doesn't seem to have any issues right now. So here's another picture. It's hard to capture in a picture the celebration and the joy that's going on here. But I tried with this picture because this lady's flinging water into the air. It kind of shows how excited they are. But they're bubbly. They're jumping. They're praising it. They don't settle down for a long time. Once they start going and they're cheering, they're so happy. And this is months after the well has been put in. Okay, this is, we're coming in and they realize, okay, these are the people who put the well in. So 
this well was probably drilled, I don't know, six months prior. But then when they realized the truck is coming, you know, our, our truck, our Hilux, and they know that you know, we are the ones that made it possible, you know, they just go crazy. We have a big celebration, we have a big party, and we wrap up the well with what's called bling. Uh, and then we wrap children's heads. So you see the green cray paper around these kids' heads. You know, we just make it fun and make a celebration. So here's a picture of me doing a water well dedication. I'm actually interviewing the lady on the left, and Andrew is translating. And I'm asking her, what was life like before the water well was put in, and what was life like after? The reason I'm doing the dedication is because we split up with a limited amount of time. Pastor Kurt took a team and did some wells, and I took a team and did some other wells. Actually, now is probably a great time to share with you. I have that same notebook that's in the picture. And I wanted to share a little bit about how life changed um, because of the water well. So this is just a random uh, water well from the book. I figured I'd share with you what kind of things we take down. <clears throat> so this well is in a village called Kela Patala. This is an example well. The depth is 31 meters. It was put in on May 8th, 2022. We say thank you to the donor. And then we ask how many households use this water well. In this case, it was 75 households or around 400 people. The closest well before this water well was a shallow well. It was basically a hole dug in the ground by hand. It was a, kilo, a kilometer away, about 15 minutes. This is on the short end. Typically, women will say it takes at least an hour and a half, an hour, an hour and a half to go get water. And then during the dry season, the well would dry up. The nearest water well was they said was an hour walk, uh, meaning pumpable water well, was an hour walk, and they were in danger of hyenas and black mambas. This is from the ladies that we interview. They're telling us, we were scared of hyenas and black mambas. Their children were suffering with diarrhea. The babies could have no bath before bed. Um, typically, they would wake up with their moms at 4 o'clock in the morning to go get the water. And so the kids were late to school. The kids were not doing well in school. They would fall asleep in school, or they'd drop out of school because of that. Marriages were failing because the women were gone so often, and the husbands were worried about their wives. Uh, oftentimes, we found out that the husbands didn't trust their wives or, or where they were, and so it caused a lot of division. Lastly, there was a low harvest because of this. As you can imagine, you go out at 4 in the morning, you get water, you come back at 9, 9.30. The sun's already high in the sky at that point during harvest season. So they're telling us, we got a low harvest. We can't work as much because we're so exhausted from getting water. So they can't, they can't harvest the corn and the soybeans that they planted out there. After this water well, I, they always laugh. I ask, how far away is your water well? And usually they'll just turn and point because it's, they're so much closer. They can point to their house from the water well. They said two to three minutes. Um, there's no more diarrhea, no more cholera. As soon as these things are put in, it seems that the waterborne disease goes away. Um, on time to school, the kids are waking up at a reasonable hour. The moms are staying closer to home and getting them ready and getting them out the door. They said they woke up at six o'clock now. Marriages were restored. Um, when we asked what the women do with their free time, they said they chat with family, they uh, chat with other community development groups, they have more time to harvest, they started tree nurseries and gardens, and the men often start making bricks pretty immediately after the water is made available. So this is just one well. I picked it at random out of our book, but this is a, a repeating testimony from a lot of these wells, and it was very eye-opening for me to be able to interview these ladies this time. They also uh, can make more than one trip to this well. Yeah. So they have fresh water all day. Yeah. yeah. And the kids can go to school. So Bobby D just said they, they can go multiple times to the well, which is another huge benefit for them. You know, it's not just one bucket and they come back and they're exhausted. They can go multiple times. And so instead of fighting at the well, now they're lining up at the borehole and just chatting because they know that they've got a plentiful water source. So moving along, here's a picture of a well in operation. 
we put a couple balloons to celebrate, but you can see the kids are washing their hands. Uh, you can see the joy. These people are excited. This is just a small group that came out, but usually the groups are much larger. And you can see these, this girl and the baby, they both look very healthy. Their skin looks very healthy as compared to somebody who might not have that clean water source. So back at camp, in the mornings, we'll typically set up an inverter. This is how we charge phones. This is how we charge the Jesus film batteries. We put an inverter on the truck. I thought this was worth showing because you know, it's just kind of one of these things that everybody wants to charge their phone. And then as soon as you take the inverter and you put it on the truck, you get a bunch of, a swarm of people and they all plug their phones and next thing you know, nobody's getting any charge. But uh, it's, it's something that we do every morning. And up at the top is the Jesus film battery. And that's the most important thing to get charged. So there's Pastor Kurt. This is walking back to Kela as we wrap up the water well dedication there and we prepare to go home to Blantyre. But before we do, we've got to pack our our burrito, which is our big tarp wrapped up that covers all our supplies and protects it from dust. So there's me and Pastor Kurt. That's a burrito on top of the truck. You can see it's just a tarp, and we fold it up like a burrito, and we ratchet it down with ratchet straps. Here's another truck with a burrito. So then we drove back to Blantyre from Mangochi. Google Maps will say three hours and 17 minutes, but it's never three hours and 17 minutes. So it's always gonna take a little bit longer, but we had really smooth sailing this year. I mean, honestly, the drives were not that bad. We didn't have, I don't remember any car troubles worth mentioning even, so we thank God for that. These are little birds that Pastor Chalambe here went ahead and ate after this picture. Um, so I'm just gonna move on. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't try them. They were almost appetizing, though. So it's hard to see in this picture, but on the left, you know, when you look out the windows of the truck, there's all kinds of shops on the side of the road, and they have funny names. And so I asked one of our translators, hey, what does this one mean? If you can see, it says chakon chako. And I was like, what does that mean? So that, they said, yeah, that means what's yours is yours. So for the rest of the trip, that's what we kept on saying. Hey, chaco on chaco. So there's me Google translating it. Yeah, but there's all kinds of fun names. The shops, that's what, it just, it makes it so funny because every shop has these really interesting and fun names. It's, yeah. Anyways, this is at the Blantyre Foursquare Church. These are students from the New Beginning Secondary School across the Parking lot from the church is the school, and so we pulled them in. We had an assembly, and Andrew, Russell, and I led a little bit of worship, and we shared the gospel. Then, okay, so that's the last part of the Mangochi team. Then Andrew, Pastor Ross, AJ, John Frederick, those guys all left, and it was just me and Pastor Kurt. And we were planning to go to Insanje in the southern end of Malawi, but because of rain, it got canceled. So we made the best of what we could do, and we went to do some water well dedications around Blantyre. This is at a school. This water well was put in last year, and they've already seen some really cool changes. What they've done is they started a porridge, um, weekly porridge making, <coughs> I don't want to say ministry because it's just the community comes together and they make porridge for the students. And they're able to do that because they can get clean water, as you can imagine, rather than going down to a riverbank, sending a kid to get water, bring it back, and how much water do you need to feed hundreds of students? So that's been really cool that these kids have continuing dependable source of food as well as the clean water. So they all came out even though it was raining, and we played with balloons while Pastor Kurt interviewed and talked to the people there. Uh, I had a lot of fun at this one. So as you can see, I mean, it's really wet in this picture. It started to clear up. That was probably the wettest that it got. We kept doing more water well dedications. Here's another one near Blantyre. This is in Chaleka, where the airport is. Um, I think this is the same area. I think I have some pictures of the kids here. Yeah, so he's interviewing the people here in Chaleka. It's right there by the airport. You 
pull out of the international airport in Blantyre, and you go an hour down the road, and they don't have access to clean water. So there's a real need there. And um, just this year, more than last year, I'm really starting to recognize it's, it's right there. You know, right next to this big city where people do have, you know, plumbed water, you've got people that have no access to water. And so this changes their lives. Here's some kids. Look at this little guy. Come on. So then, here's some more kids at another water well. I was actually, I'm pretty proud of this one because I was doing the wrapping of the heads now because it's just me and Pastor Kurt, and so I became the bling king. And so I got to play with the kids and wrap their heads and pray for each one as we did that. Okay, so another important point. During the rain, we couldn't set up the Jesus film. As you can imagine, the ground's muddy. There's, you know, it's not ideal to set up a projector and a screen in the middle of the rain. So instead, we preach the gospel at the well. So what you're seeing here is Paul Machiza on the left side of the screen in black. He's preaching the gospel to these people at the well. So we dedicate the well. We film a thank you for the donors. And once the camera goes off, we're able to share with them, this is because of the Lord Jesus Christ and his great love, and we just share what happened in our lives. We share testimonies. I was able to share a testimony at a water well, but Paul here, I think, is basically telling them the gospel, the good news, that if they repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be saved. Um, so that's it. Another zoomed out shot. We're in the hillock still. We actually put, this is a great shot because it shows our little wooden roof rack that we built. I'm actually Pretty proud of this one. We put zip ties through the plywood and we zip, <laughs> we zip tied it on, but we never got to use it to go to Insanje. So that was kind of fun. We had a little project while we were down there. So here's Pastor Kurt in Mo and Mix, our little bed and breakfast. This is kind of a fun one because it's just us hanging out and he's actually making popcorn in a little gas stove inside this motel. I mean, what motel in America lets you make popcorn with a gas stove that you bring in? It's, I love it. It's, we had a lot of fun, and we watched a movie on the little projector in the room. Here we are getting our COVID tests. There's, on no leg do you need a negative PCR test. In America, you don't need it. In London, you don't need it. But to leave the country, we still needed a negative PCR test to leave. All right, and so after we got our test in, we're waiting for it to come around. We're waiting for our flight, and we still had a couple of days to do... Um, Water well dedication. So it's getting more and more cleared up. You see the weather's kind of getting nicer. There's me and Paul uh, at one of the dedications. Finally, we get a couple cleared up days. And then, not sure who this man is, but he was so happy. I, I took a picture with him and clear skies behind him. So by the time we left Blantyre, the weather really cleared up. And we left feeling pretty good about what we got done in Blantyre. For having been canceled, you know, having that Ensanje trip canceled, we got a lot of water well dedications done, and we were able to share the gospel with a lot of people at the well. So we were able to do a lot with the time that we had. Here's a couple more pictures. This is a well that was um, donated by Brittany Harris on the left there. And so we were just visiting old wells. This is in Cholo. And we were just saying, hey, how's the well working? Is it still taste good? You know, how's the water coming from it? Just doing a checkup because we want to make sure this is sustainable and, and you can see the garden on the right side. You know, something that's stood out to me about these water wells is that there's a huge pride of ownership. I mean, immediately after the wells are put in, they're planting gardens, they're planting flowers around the well, they're putting bricks around the well, they're doing things to make the well nice, and some of these villages actually have a cleaning schedule. All of the villages have a water committee, but some of them put together a schedule. Who's gonna clean it on what day? Who's gonna maintain it on what day? So they're really, I mean, that was, I was so happy to see that. There's real pride of ownership, and they're so happy, and they're so appreciative of this gift. And there's, it does, it's, it's not lost on them how incredible this gift is, and so that was really cool. Some of them, have problems with theft, and so they put locking mechanisms. Some of these villages come together, they put locking mechanisms so that thieves can't steal these parts. Because the head of this water well 
will actually come off for servicing. And so people will come by and try and steal parts off the water well. So they lock them down. Uh, anyways, here's a sunset. This is at a place called Game Haven where we went for dinner. Sometimes Pastor Kurt will turn to me and say, hey, get a picture of this, send it to Irma. And so this is one of those where he said, get a picture of this, send it to Irma. I said, okay. Here we are, you know, we're wrapping up. We're putting our video footage onto the laptop. That's Pastor Davis and Pastor Kurt in the background poking his head out from his mosquito net. We want to make sure that we leave them in a good place and that, you know, while we still can coordinate face to face, we get all our ducks in a row. So they're coordinating audio and video from the videos that we took and making sure that, you know, when we leave, they both are comfortable with the data that they have. So. Pastor Davis will actually make some donor videos. And um, so, anyways, it all takes teamwork. It's an international endeavor. This mission is two teams from two different sides of the globe. And it went very well. I mean, this is obviously before everybody else left. Um, and you guys are definitely involved as well. So a huge thank you for you guys, to you guys for sending us. I know that. Without you, we wouldn't have been able to be successful on this trip. So I want to say a huge thank you to you guys who've been praying for us. Each person that goes is asked to get 10 prayer warriors and ask 10 people, hey, will you pray for me? Can you pray for me while we're on this trip? And those prayers, uh, you know, they're, they're so valuable because they really change things. And then I feel like they made things go, you know, they give us favor. Okay, so at this point, yes, sir. When you have your prayer partners yeah. and you're working in Malawi, the last week or so you start feeling kind of used, used up. Mm -hmm. You kind of feel kind of lackadaisical. Your prayers pick us up, give us a second wind mm -hmm. where we can complete the mission on time and in. Uh, with, with good force. So, yeah, prayers are important. Prayer partners. I agree. I'm so grateful for you guys. I've got some great prayer partners. So, this picture, all right, this is where I want to start my little message. So, we finished up Malawi. Um, that was a brief overview of the work that was done in Malawi. I want to share a message that stuck out to me. We we're actually reading this. I was reading this on the plane ride home, and I got convicted, and I wanted to share it because it's really an awesome message. So well, here we are, two men getting on a plane. What a great way to introduce. This is a turboprop. This is we're going to Zimbabwe, but it's also a great introduction. So two men get on a plane. There's my two men. And I'm going to read it. This story is straight out of a book called God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life, The Myth of the Modern Message. Uh, by Ray Comfort. So, two men are seated in a plane. The first is given a parachute. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on because it will improve his flight. He is a little skeptical at first. He cannot see how wearing a parachute on, a bo on board a plane could possibly improve his flight. After some time, he decides to experiment and see if the claims are true. As he straps the apparatus onto his back, he notices the weight of it on his shoulders, and he finds he now has difficulty sitting upright. However, he consoles himself with the flight attendant's promise that the parachute will improve his flight, and he decides to give it a little time. As the flight progresses, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him because he is wearing a parachute inside the plane. He begins to feel somewhat humiliated. As they continue to laugh and point at him, he can stand it no longer. He sinks in his seat, unstraps the parachute, and throws it to the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fill his heart because, as far as he is concerned, he was told an outright lie. The second man is also given a parachute, but listen to what he is told. He is told to put it on because at any moment he will have to jump out of the plane at 25,000 feet. He gratefully puts the parachute on. He does not notice the weight of it upon his shoulders, nor is he concerned that he cannot sit upright. 
his mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without the parachute. All right, some of you are starting to understand where I'm getting at with this. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of each passenger's experience. The first man's motive for putting on the parachute was solely to improve his flight. The result of his experience was that he was humiliated by the other passengers, disillusioned, and somewhat embittered against those who gave him the parachute. As far as he is concerned, it will be a long time before anyone gets one of those things on his back again. The second man put on the parachute solely to survive the jump to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him if he jumped without it, he has a deep-rooted joy and peace in his heart, knowing that he has been saved from certain death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. Okay. So, many modern evangelistic appeals say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll give you love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. The sinner responds and in an experimental fashion puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promised temptation, tribulation, and persecution. He finds it difficult to live an upright life. Not only that, but other people mock him for his faith. So what does he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus Christ. He is offended, by the, he is offended for the word's sake. He is disillusioned and somewhat embittered, and quite rightly so. He was promised love, joy, peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness, and all he got were trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed toward those who gave him the so-called good news. Because he thinks he tried Jesus and it didn't work out, his latter end becomes worse than the first. He is now another inoculated and bitter backslider. Instead of preaching that Jesus will improve the flight, we should be warning sinners that one day they will have to jump out of the plane. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. When a sinner understands the horrific consequences of breaking the law of God, he will flee to the Savior in genuine repentance solely to escape the wrath that is to come. If we are true and faithful witnesses, that is what we will be preaching that there is wrath to come and that God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. The issue is not one of happiness, but one of righteousness. I hope you guys enjoyed my little demonstration there. It does not matter how happy a sinner is or how much he is enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. Without the righteousness of Christ, he will perish on the day of wrath. The Bible says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 11.4 Peace and joy are legitimate fruits of salvation, but it is not legitimate to use these fruits as a drawing card for salvation. If we do, the sinner will respond with an impure motive lacking repentance. Can you remember why the second passenger had joy and peace in his heart? It was because he knew that the parachute was going to save him from certain death. In the same way, as Christians, we have joy and peace in believing, Romans 15, 13, because we know that the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver us from the wrath to come. So that's my demonstration of the two men on the plane. The first man, obviously... I've done this at Trader Joe's where I went up to a man and I said, Jesus loves you. And he just, he's like, all right. And he kept on packing his car. And I walked away, I thought, well, that wasn't very productive. But what we should be doing is telling people the truth, that they're in danger. There's a real danger, and the wrath of God abides on the wicked. So anyways, I hope you guys found that helpful. So then we went to visit Nicholas in Zimbabwe. We were so excited because, you know, this is a treat, really. Usually you fly to Malawi, you do, you know, the mission, you work hard, and then, you know, sometimes you get to stop off, but I just plan on going home. But then Pastor Kurt said, hey, you and me are going to go to Zimbabwe. We're going to try and catch a tigerfish. So we flew to, all right, so I did this slide a little different. 
On the right side, we flew from Blantyre to Lilongwe, and then we f that was a layover in Lilongwe, and then we flew to Harare. And then we drove to Lasting Impressions. It's outside a town called Kadoma. <clears throat> so Lasting Impressions is a venue. It's typically used for church camps and weddings and retreats, but it's a big venue with lodging, and it's got a huge dining hall and places for people to get married. And while we were there, there was a children's camp. So we, I wanted to share their mission. It kind of sums it up. We aim to make a positive impact on the hearts and minds of the people of Zimbabwe for Christ through educational camps, inspirational retreats, and community events in a picturesque setting. So it's a mission originally started by a man from Zimbabwe, and then he met his wife, who's from Thousand Oaks area, when she came to visit Zimbabwe. And they were great hosts. Here's a picture of Nick and his wife, Rachel. They got married very recently, and now they're both working in Zimbabwe teaching these kids here. This is actually a, uh, probably about a week-long camp. It was a school from Harare that drove out. But they're teaching about insects um, in this presentation. Um, a little more detail on what these guys do because I knew I'd want to share. They do family camps, they do day outings, corporate groups, pastors, and church retreats. They do weddings, team building, and leadership, uh, environmental camps, and celebrations. I knew I'd need that slide. So there's another pic of Nick and Rachel and their owl. His name is Woody the Wood Owl. And here's the lasting impression update of last March. It says, Nick and Rachel have been rehabilitating various creatures. One beauty is an immature African eagle. Um, they since found out that it's a wood owl. But it has an injured wing. Uh, we also seem to have a growing menagerie of reptiles that are fascinating for kids of all ages. The zebras have gotten comfortable coming into camp to mow the lawns. It's actually very helpful. Um, so here's some of the animals that Nick showed us. This is kind of fun for us. He, he pulled out this owl, and he's holding it almost like you would a cat. It's very interesting because you think, oh, it's, won't it bite you? But that's just Nick and Rachel. They, they're so good with animals. So there's Pastor Kurt with a little tortoise. He loves tortoises. And there's what's called a file snake. This is a non-venomous snake, but they often get killed because they're spooky. This is a chameleon. This is a cool animal. I mean, to, you hear about them, you see them on TV, but then we're, we're standing in the sunlight, and on the left picture you can see he's green. It's because Pastor Kurt just turned his arm from the shade to the light. They're green in the shade, but then you put them in the light, and they're dark. this same chameleon could turn black over the course of a couple minutes in order to thermoregulate its body. That's how God has created these animals with these these abilities to regulate their their body temperature and so they turn black and also if you put it on different surfaces they'll blend in and you won't be able to see them <laughs> so we had a lot of fun with those then we went fishing off of this dock and pastor kurt lost his lure into a tree so it was a good excuse to get in the canoe with nick and go fish it out of there here's a picture of wildebeest we went and fed the zebras and wildebeests on the property and we found out that these two animals, zebras and wildebeest, actually roll together in their herds because a zebra will eat the top portion of the grass, then the wildebeest will come along and eat the middle portion of the grass, and then the zebra will come again and eat the very bottom portion of the grass again. It just, I never would have known that they hang out in the same herds. You think they're totally different animals. Why would they do that? All right, so here's some more pictures of the zebras. Here's a picture of Nick and Pastor Kurt, and that's Alistair, the owner of Lasting Impressions, and Nick's new father-in-law by, uh, by the truck. There's Pastor Kurt hugging a tree and holding a gun. So <laughs> we, he's, he's a character. So then uh, Alistair took us to see this termite mound. This is an extinct these termites apparently were three to four inches long. They're huge, but they're all extinct now. And so 
we learned a lot about these mounds that are just ginormous, and apparently they were termites that are now extinct. So we put, took the boat out, and we did a little fishing while we were out there. We saw a big crocodile. Do I have it? I have it. So that's the crocodile we saw. I had to pause my video and take a screenshot and put him in there. And um, lastly, we were able to share the gospel. So here on the left side, this is basically an outdoor little hall where there's a bunch of kids. And this group of kids, you know, we, after they finish dinner and their after dinner game, like there's camp leaders that organize a game. They go down to this hall and they do praise and worship. And so on two nights, I was actually able to go and play worship with these kids. And on the second night, I was able to share my testimony with them. And Pastor Kurt was able to share the gospel with them. This is a very cool... Mi- go ahead. What, what language did they speak? Uh, these kids speak English. Yeah, they were speaking English. So no interpreters here. Yeah. And then, this is really cool, y'all. I'm excited about just being there. God was doing something in my heart, being able to see these kids and just having the freedom to share with them the truth, you know, that our school system might not allow. You know, we're able to tell them about Jesus and what he's done on the cross. And they're able to come away from their homes. And in Harare, they're able to come out to this place, which really is a retreat for them. And it's a, it's a huge treat for them. And they're... They're so, they're funny. I mean, they're in their pajamas. And so I was like, where am I? I, Because there's, yeah, anyways. So we shared the gospel with them, and one child came up. His name was Michael, and he asked a whole plethora of questions. These kids, they had some really deep questions for 10-year-olds. But Michael came up, and he asked, how do I know I'm forgiven? How, How do I know I have a faith? How do I, you know, and so Pastor Kurt, you know, went in and tackled, and he said, the most important thing is that you know that, Jesus loves you and that you're saved by Jesus alone. And so, you know, he did a sinner's prayer with these guys. He basically said, do you want to know right now that Jesus is Lord of your life and that, you know, you're safe from the wrath to come? As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him for Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 11 through 13. The same Lord is Lord of all, whether in Zimbabwe or Los Angeles, Redondo Beach, Malawi. We're all worshiping the same God. And when we make that landing in Blantyre and they pick us up from the airport, you know you're with your brothers. And it's just this joy, this joy of knowing you both answer to the same boss. I, I can't even explain, but when we land and you see these guys from the other side of the world, and you have joy, it's, it's the most amazing thing. You know, you're on one team, you're on God's team, and I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to be able to go and to do that. So lastly, here's our picture we wrapped up in Zimbabwe. Here's some other folks who are on God's team in Zimbabwe, whether it's Malawi, Zimbabwe, or Redondo Beach, we're all working for God, and we know that He's always working. So... Um, yeah? Bobby D. Yes. Uh, this is Nick and Rachel Francis. That's yeah, right. Nick and Rachel Francis. This is Nick's mother oh. over here and grandmother. Yes. All right. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Awesome. And Marvin, Marvin is on location and he's, he's uh, yeah. uh, in the movie industry. Yeah. So everybody that knows that Rachel yeah. and Nick are part of our church family. That's right. So for everybody online, so you know what Bobby D just said, that's Nick and Rachel Francis. They're part of our church. Nick just left, I think last year, right, to go to Zimbabwe. And so he's a missionary from the Breakwater Mega Embassy. And his mom is here, Isabel and Susan. Yeah, Susan is Isabel's mom. So we've got uh, multiple generations of, uh, of, of his family here. And we're so excited for him. I'm, having seen him in his natural element out there, I mean, Nick was made for Africa. Yeah. Nick 
is jumping on and off of this Land Rover Defender. He's opening the gates, he's closing the gates, he's picking up owls, he's picking up all these snakes. He's just, you could tell he's so excited to be there. He's in his element. He was definitely happy to see some people from America there, but he is coming, uh, you know, he's, he's really like fitting into this place just beautifully. And he's, him and his wife are so happy. He goes by Badger and she goes by Sunshine. Sunshine because at camp they don't use their real name. So all the kids come up and they say, Badger, and that's Nick. And they'll say, Sunshine, and that was Rachel. So Pastor Kurt, you know, he doesn't know that the kids don't know that they're married. So he tells them, hey, Badger and Sunshine are married. And all the kids went, whoo, like they, they were so like, wow, we didn't know. Because I don't know. Anyway, you know how kids are. It was just fun for them. So anyways, Alistair is Rachel's dad, and their hospitality was amazing. You know, it, when we landed at the airport, it was the same thing as when we landed in Malawi. Immediately, it's, how are you, how you been? It's like, you're, this is a brother. Immediately, you know. The camaraderie is there. The fellowship is there. The hospitality, like I said, was incredible. The love that they have for the brethren, it's just, there's no better, you know, there's no better friendship that you can have just right off the bat. That, that dog is a Staffordshire Terrier. Yeah, that is Tank. And that is now my favorite dog in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I love this dog. I should have put him in the video, but I didn't get a video of him. So if you go up to him and you howl, he'll start howling back and saying, I love you. So I played fetch with him for like an hour and a half one morning. He never got tired. But back to the slideshow. I've only got one slide left. I wanted to share a scripture that I thought was so pertinent and so special because it's, it talks about what we did. And it's Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We know that God sends people out to go preach the gospel. And we thank you guys here at Breakwater Church for sending us to Malawi. You guys made this thing possible. Thank you to everybody who donated to getting us there for plane tickets, to everybody who's been praying for us here in the States, for everybody who's been you know, taking late night calls or, you know, we have people that are, our travel agent is pretty much, you call her and she's ready and she'll help you with whatever. We had a flight that was canceled to Zimbabwe and she helped us get back on track. So it's just, there's a lot of moving pieces and we just wanna say a huge thank you to everybody who sent us and to made this thing possible. So with that, I think that's it for me. I just, uh, thank you guys. So with that, that's all that I have. I guess we'll have the worship team come on up and I'll just, I'd like to pray real quick and uh, just give thanks to the Lord of hosts. Father, we thank you. We praise your name. We bless your name. We thank you that you are so good. You're so faithful. You're so kind. You're so generous. You're so loving, Lord. We thank you for the grace that you poured out at the cross. We thank you that you made a way where there was no way, Lord. We thank you that you made a way for us, even though we didn't deserve it. We know that the wages of our sin was death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We know that you demonstrate your love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you would continue to do this wonderful work in Malawi, that you would continue to raise up leaders in Malawi, that you would continue to raise up leaders among the Blantyre Foursquare Church in Malawi and in this church in Breakwater Mega Embassy here in Redondo Beach. We pray that you would continue to encourage this church. We pray that you would continue to just change hearts and move uh, people to godly sorrow and true repentance. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we yield to you. We surrender our plans. We surrender our wills. We surrender the works of our hands. We give it all to you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Just enough fear by the side of the road Hear you speak, won't let go Fall to my knees as I lift my hands to pray Got every reason to be here again Father's love draws me in All my eyes want to see is a glimpse of you All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Is you, Lord All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Is you, Lord One more day is not the same Spirit calls my heart to sing Drawn to the voice of my Savior once again Where would my soul be without your son? He gave his life to save the earth Rest in the thought that you're watching over me All I need is you All I need is you, Lord All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Yes, you, Lord All I need is you All I need is you, Lord Yes, you, Lord All I need is you I need is you, Lord. Is you, Lord. Is all I need is you. All I need is you. Is all I need is you. All I
Father God up in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for just everything, Lord. Thank you for blessing us with this beautiful day and this inspiring message from Chris, Lord. What beautiful thing that's happening over there. And it's just, it's just nice that we know you, Lord, and we do need to step out, step out of our comfort zone and, and start telling people, let fear aside and, and tell people about you, Lord, and, just, and, and give them the gift, like he said, how precious are the feet that walk and speak about you, Jesus. Thank you that somebody did that for us, Lord. Wouldn't be here without that, and so grateful I am, Lord. I'm grateful for everybody that's here and that they're here because they heard your word too, Lord. We love you when we pray this in your precious son Jesus' name. Amen.